This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 844. What's going on, everyone? This is David Green, your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, here today with my co host, Rob Abasolo. And if you didn't know, this is the biggest, the best, the baddest real estate podcast on the planet every week, bringing you the information, the how to's, and the stories that you need to be successful in this current market. Now, today's guest, Jim Quick, is a world renowned expert. Uh, known as a brain coach. He helps people to be smarter, which is a pretty cool thing to help people be good at. And as you all know that are listening to this, today's real estate market is the most challenging that I've ever seen, probably the most challenging that many of you have seen. But during times like this, you can still improve yourself to hopefully find deals that you might not have saw before, make deals that you might not have made, or be ready when the market does turn around. Mm -hmm. Jim Mm -hmm. has worked with organizations like Google, Nike, and SpaceX. He is a New York Times bestselling author. And he joined Brandon and I back on episode 443, where he shared 10 ways to learn anything faster. For those that are loyal Bigger Pockets podcast listeners, this is the same guest who Brandon and I share our most embarrassing moment in podcast history. When Brandon <laughs> bragged to Jim about how good our systems were, that we didn't need a good memory, and then forgot to hit the record button. And we talked to Jim for about 35 minutes and then had the uncomfortable, awkward moment of having to tell him that after bragging, Brandon had forgot to hit the button. And to be honest, we like silently contemplated if we should just not tell him that we weren't recording. <laughs> <laughs> because to go in front of one of the smartest people on the planet and tell them, hey, we forgot to hit the record button was embarrassing, but we did. That was a fire episode. That's one of the worst feelings ever. So, Jim, thank you for joining us today <laughs> to allow us to redeem ourselves. We have confirmed that we are thank you, Jim. indeed recording. Oh, no. actually, I don't think we <laughs> are. Can we run that from the beginning just one more time? No, I'm just kidding. All right, hit it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about how to hack our brains to succeed in any situation. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit about your backstory. Why is brain science so personal for you? So I didn't know I was going to do this as growing up. I didn't, you know, a brain coach. I don't even know if that role existed. I, um, my inspiration was my desperation. I had a series of uh, head injuries when I was a child and one particular TBI really messed me up. I had, uh, I took a bad fall when I was five years old, head first into a radiator and rushed to the emergency room. And, you know, it just, it just, that it just sucked. I mean, the, the, it ends up turning out pretty well for me, but because of it, I had learning issues. I had uh, learning disabilities, uh, processing issues. Teachers would repeat themselves over and over again. And I would learn to pretend to understand, you know what I mean? But I, I didn't understand anything. Poor focus, poor memory. It took me three years longer to learn how to read, and that was really embarrassing. So I had a lot of self-doubt, a lot of fear, a lot of embarrassment, probably a little shame thrown in. When I was nine years old, I was slowing down a class and being teased more than usual that day. And I remember on that particular day, a teacher came to my defense and she pointed to me in front of the whole class and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And uh, that label kind of became my my limit. And every single time I did badly in school, which was like every week, I would say, oh, because I have the broken brain. Every time I was picked for sports, I would say, oh, and I, you know, I have the broken, I'm broken. And so, uh, yeah, I struggled. But it's interesting over time, I don't know if anyone can relate to this, that sometimes your struggles could become your strengths, that with challenge comes change. So anyone facing adversity right now in any area of your life, just want to remind you that adversity can, in some cases, be an advantage. Like, I don't know one strong person that had an easy life and, um, uh, and you know, and every single day we have a chance because we have a we have a choice. We recently had a, a guest on Andy Gill. I got to meet him at BPCon. Really nice guy. He has ADHD, and that he sort of uh, that that whole episode was him talking about how that made it you know life a little bit difficult sometimes. But he sort of pivoted it and really kind of leaned into the ADHD sort of being his superpower type of thing. And it sounds like that's like a similar approach where you know you have this adversity, but how can you how can you put the spin on that to actually make it your strength? Yes, yeah, this whole idea where, you know, is life happening to you or maybe is it happening for you? I'm, I'm sure some people have been through, you, you hear a lot about post-traumatic stress. We don't hear sure. a lot about post-traumatic growth where part of those people have been through trauma. They come through it. And I don't know if someone listening can relate to it, but where you wouldn't wish it upon anybody, the situation that happened to you, but 
through it, you found something, you found a trait or maybe a strength, you got some clarity, maybe found a mission or purpose, something, something good came out of it. You know, I think some things we can only learn in a storm, right? And some storms come because they, they help clear our path. And yeah, so the world is, whether it's economic or political, whatever is going on, just want to remind people we have, we have agency, you know, we always can make a a new choice and one step in another direction can completely change your, your destination in life. And in your efforts to overcome some of those initial challenges, which were incredibly painful, no doubt, you did research that led to some incredible insights that now all of our listeners get to benefit from. So thank you for being here. We're going to get into some of Jim's lies of learning, but first let's get a quick word from today's show sponsors. All right. We are here with brain coach Jim Quick, who just shared a story of some of the the pain that he went through when he was a child. And I know when you're going through pain as a child, I also had a very painful childhood. It's different than pain as an adult. You've got some like uh, like mechanisms of which you can process pain once you've been alive a little bit longer. But once you're in those formative years, you just feel all of it and it could just be overwhelming. And I love the line you said that you don't know any successful people that didn't have a painful childhood. And that's a lot of hope to the people that do struggle with some of those things. And we have a gem like you, Mr. Jim Quick. So I love it. Like some of my favorite people to listen to are the people that have been through the most pain. So tell me, what are the lies of learning? So we go through some of them uh, in the book. We So the book initially, Limitless Expanded, it was a book on all methodology, on accelerated learning and brain optimization. That's kind of my, my superpower. Uh, teaching people how to have the best brains possible and also learn faster. I think the faster you can learn, the faster you can earn in any industry, right? I believe two of the most costly words sometimes in life or work are, I forgot. I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot the meeting. I forgot that conversation. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot that person's name. I forgot to hit the record button, right? <laughs> All those things could, we can lose time and, you know, credibility, but also on the other side, memory can make you money, right? When you can easily remember facts and figures or client information, product information, give uh, presentations without the use of notes. It, we live in an expert economy where knowledge is not only power, knowledge is profit. And the faster you can learn, the faster you can earn. So the book, when I first one is going to send it to my publisher, it was all on methodology on how to read faster and remember and do all those things. But then I was like, before I hit send, I was like, will a hundred percent of the people who read this book get the, you know, the rewards that they're hoping for? And the honest answer was no, because we had to address besides methodology, two other areas, which are your mindset and your motivation. So if you feel stuck, limitless is not about being perfect. It's about advancing and progressing. But if you feel like you're in a box, that box by definition, you can't break out of, right? It's a, maybe it's your income, maybe it's your impact, maybe it's your health, maybe it's some area of your career, you feel like you're stuck. And uh, so the three dimensions that make a box, these are the three forces that will get you out of that box that will liberate you. So it's your mindset, your motivation and the methods. So the lies fall underneath methodology. I mean, uh, not just methodology, but your mindset, right? Your set of mm-hmm. assumptions and attitudes you have about something. So let's say somebody learns something on your podcast to make more money, right? To close more deals, to be able to increase their income, but they're not doing it. Part of the reason might be their mindset. You know, at some level, they might not believe it's possible. They might not believe they're capable of it. Maybe it's possible for somebody else, but who's listening, but not capable for them. Maybe they don't believe at some level they, they deserve it. Right. And so that falls underneath mindset. And when it comes to learning, there are certain uh, lies that we should probably address to unravel because they could hold us back at events. I'll do these demonstrations where I'll have like 50 people or a hundred people, depending on how much time we have, just pass around a microphone and introduce themselves. And I'll remember all their names. And I think that's such an important skill in business because how are you going to show somebody you're going to care for their future, their finances, their their property, whatever, if you don't care enough just to remember like them. So uh, it's probably the number one business etiquette skill. But if you have a limiting belief at events, people pull me aside and like, I know you're a memory coach. I'm so glad you're here. I have a horrible memory. They'll say that to me. And I'll say, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you fight for your limits, they're yours. <clears throat> your brain wow. is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk is a program it will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering people's names. You will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. 
And so, you know, when we're thinking about our thoughts and these lies, one of them, I call a lie, it's an acronym for me. It's a limited idea entertain, L-I-E, limited idea entertain. It might not be true that you're too old or that you're not smart enough um, because all behavior is belief driven. You've identified seven lies of learning. And uh, I know on today's show, we're going to cover three of those Mm -hmm. that we think will be valuable for the listener. So we'll name the lie and then you can tell us what what it gets wrong and what the true version of it is. Is that is that cool? Yeah, that's perfect. Let's do it. Okay, awesome. So lie number one, mistakes are failures. Yeah, I I, I don't think that's the case. I, I, I think failure, there's no such thing as failure. There's just failure to learn. I believe that feedback is the breakfast of, of superheroes, if you will, right? You, you can make a mistake, but those mistakes don't have to make us. And the reality, the truth is that... Failure is not the opposite of success, right? And I'm sure you guys have examples of this. Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is part of success, right? You fail forward. You know, we make mistakes because it gives us feedback on how to do something better if we if we choose to learn something from it and we're not limited, you know, by that. And so I would say failure is uh, and mistakes is not a bad thing. You want to be able to make it, maybe make it quick, but learning from it is, I think is most, most important. So you don't repeat it. Like if you make a mistake once, sure, it's a mistake, but if you make it twice, then it's kind of a choice, right? If we didn't learn from it the first time. I had a basketball coach and they had that exact same philosophy. He said, listen, if you do something wrong, either you didn't know, or you didn't care. If I've Mm -hmm. never told you that that's on me, you didn't know you weren't supposed to do it. But if it's been explained and you did it again, you didn't care enough to make the adjustment. And I, I feel like that ties in with the, what you're saying. Yeah. And built in that is a reminder that we have agency. You know, we have a lesser level of sovereignty. I want to remind people that they're the, they're the pilot of their, their mind. Mm-hmm. They're the pilot of their life. They don't have to be the, just the passenger where things are just happening to you, where you just have to react to like, no, this is just the economic yeah. client. You know, this is the climate or, you know, this is just the market. Right. Cause if anyone could succeed, that means it's possible. Right. And if you're willing to, you know, adopt that mindset, you're motivated and use the correct methods consistently, then you're going to get similar results without a doubt. That's really good. Uh, we know that mistakes don't have to be considered failures, but we often are so afraid of the pain that will come from a mistake that we will treat them like failures and run away from it. Uh, I know that's not necessarily your area of expertise, but do you have anything you can share on the power that we give failures when we interpret them or we assign meaning to them that can be painful? Yeah, even changing things like there is no failure, there's just feedback. It just changes the conversation. You know, I remember we, we do an annual brain performance conference, and I remember one year we had um, Quincy Jones in the audience, you know, this, this music producer legend, and I could help but a uh, pull him on stage. I kind of, uh, without plan, just spontaneously. And I had this conversation with them and I wanted, I asked him, you know, everyone knows that everyone else's successes. Right. And for him, it was like thriller. And it was like, we are the world and, and all these things. And, but I was like, I don't want to hear about your successes and achievements. I want to hear about, you know, your mistakes, your problems, right. I want to know what, what problems that you face, you know, in the past or currently. And he looked at me And he said, Jim, I don't have any problems. And I was like, wait, wait, you know, all human beings have some kind of challenge or problem. He's like, no, I don't have problems. He said, I have puzzles. And I was like, wow, like that just changed it. Even when I said it out loud and it just reminded myself because a puzzle just feels different than a problem. You know, for me, a puzzle is something that I did as a kid. It's fun. There's always a solution. And you could either look at a child or you could fast forward to more towards the end stages of our life. I spent a lot of time in senior centers helping them uh, polish off their memories. And while I'm doing it, I hear some amazing stories. And I feel like I could learn a lot, so much wisdom. But I also hear a lot of regret, right? And uh, it's one of those things where... You know, like maybe this person, they didn't, they pursued a career because their parents expected it of them, or they didn't pursue a relationship because what other people would think about that relationship or, or whatever. Right. And I'll just, as a reminder for everybody, if you're doing this thought experiment, it's not really positive, but when we're taking our final breaths, none of other people's opinions are really going to matter. Right. None of our fears are even going to matter. 
Uh, none of other people's expectations are going to matter. What's going to matter is, is how we laughed and how we loved and how we learned and, you know, how we lived. So I, I think beginning with the end in mind is just so very important to inform what we do today. Right. And I think it's not even about time management. It's about priority management. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing, the most important thing. Right. And hold that and tie that to your values. And then I think it gives us a little courage to take those small little steps. Rob, what about you? Any experiences with mistakes being failures and you looking at them that way? Yeah. You know, I always say that every mistake makes me a, a million <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like a future, a future million. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm very for the idea of mistakes and failures because they shape who you are. They, sh they, they make you the prudent investor that you will become. And I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, David, but I, I ask this pretty often on the podcast. When someone says that they messed up big time, when they tell us like that big failure that they had in their real estate career, I'm always like, let's be honest for a second. Would you take that back? And uh, honestly, I'm always surprised at the answers because a lot of people say, yeah, I, I kind of wish I, I didn't do that. And I'm like, but you're here today. You're here today literally because of that mistake. And uh, there are a lot of times in my real estate career, the first house I ever sold uh, was my first primary property. And I remember thinking, you know, I was, I was going to make $40,000 selling that. And I felt so dumb because I, I listened to Bigger Pockets. I wanted to get into real estate. And I felt dumb selling this property when I, when Bigger Pockets was like, yeah, you know, real estate. And I was like, but I need the $40,000 because we're going to move to LA and we'll need it to survive. And it was that $40,000 that I, took right a mistake on the surface that I then went and purchased my first property in Los Angeles that's doubled in appreciation that led to me building a tiny house that led to me building more that led to where I am today so I think always in the short term mistakes are very painful but in the long term you always look a little bit not like a genius but you look very smart for having made what were terrible decisions at the time, you know? Well, no one sees that the knowledge and the experience came from the bad decisions, right? When you're listening to social media, you're just seeing, you're seeing the muscle. You're not seeing the workouts a lot of the time. So yeah, that moves us on to lie number two, speaking about powerful bodies. Uh, lie number two is that knowledge is power. What do you have to say about that, Jim? You know, um, I'm going to kind of go in coaching mode right now, and I don't know who needs to hear this, but the truth is, None of the podcasts or books or courses, none of it works unless we work it. Right. So I, I think knowledge at, at best has, is, has the potential to be power. But obviously when we apply it or we implement that knowledge, then it becomes real power. And, you know, getting in this kind of mind shift where, you know, you start, you listen to something and just ask yourself, like, how can I use this? Right. Because otherwise it just stays like it becomes mental masturbation, right? Just stays an idea. And there's, we don't need any more ideas, right? We need more implementation. And so all the books, you, you know, people buy books, they send on their shelf and it becomes shelf help and not self help because people aren't reading shelf it. Help. Or if they're reading it, <laughs> I like it, if they're not reading it, they're, maybe they're reading it, but they're not using it. And as somebody who reads a book and doesn't use it, like they're not, they don't have any more results than anybody who's illiterate, who couldn't read the book in the first place. Right. So I just want to, I think it's an important lie to unravel a limited idea that we entertain is that knowledge is not power. It has the potential to be power when knowledge times action is a lot of power. And so I want to encourage everybody for every hour, maybe you spend learning something on a podcast or a, you know, conversation or a book or wherever you're getting your training from that you spend an equal hour putting it into play. Jim, is there a moment in your life where the, this really rang true? Is there a moment that this principle or this lie was solidified, whether it be in your journey or maybe a client that you've worked with? Yeah. I mean, even when I was first getting started, I was 18 years old and I was accumulating a lot of knowledge and I could profess about it like professors do um, and teach about it. But it never became really real until I could show people results. I think in today's economy, it's so important. You mentioned social media. Instead of saying something, I, I think it's more important we show it. Instead of promising, it's more effective if we just prove it. And so, you know, I've made that mistake also where I'll just have the idea, but nothing changes in my, let, let's say I, have, I read a book on health or something uh, or sleep, you know, that's been an issue for me when I was uh, younger, where for a long time, I was only sleeping a couple hours a night. 
because I, I had this un- undiagnosed, uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea. And I was only sleeping two hours a night for five straight years. And that, which is insane, right? Um, I was hospitalized a number of times, uh, you know, rushed to the emergency room just for lack of sleep. And it wasn't because my mind was ruminating. I had a very practiced mind. I just couldn't stay asleep because I couldn't breathe and get oxygen. And I would use dental devices or CPAP devices, breathing machines, and still didn't work. And I would, re- you know, read a lot about it and kind of learn the mechanics. But until I started putting some of these mechanics into play, like you can't, uh, you could read a book on push ups, but you're not going to get any kind of benefit unless you actually do the push ups. It's sort of how I felt really recently when I was trying to get back more into a health routine. I was watching all the videos and reading all the things and kind of slowly getting into it. And I was like, well, there's not really any results until I actually went all in. And it's the same thing with real estate where I kind of felt like my acquisitions were going down. And uh, I was like, well, how many offers have I actually made? And the answer was <laughs> 25 to 50% of what I usually do. And I was like, "Mm, all right. So the answer is to just actually do more of the things that I say I'm going to do and actually having some accountability as well. I think that's, that's always a hard part when it comes to applying knowledge is a lot of the times it's a very lonely journey to do the thing that you set out to do. Um, but when you can bring someone else to sort of toe that line with you and and keep you accountable, I, I feel like that's when I really start seeing a lot of, a lot of actual progress in any of my journey, specifically in the, in the Airbnb, like in the, the real estate side of things where I complain to my partners like, well, how many times have you done this? I'm like, well, not a lot when you make me say it out loud. And so it really does come down to actually taking action. Otherwise, what's the point of storing it all in your head? Yeah. No, I just think if you consistently act, right, then your results will speak for itself. And it, it, would, it would do the, the talking for us. It's definitely better well done than, than well said. And this lie in the world of real estate investing is probably the most prominent of all of them. Because in our space, people can trick themselves into thinking they're taking action by listening to podcasts, by paying for courses, by reading books. You get all this knowledge in your head. Like I know more about doing a push-up than anyone that's ever lived. And then someone says, how many push-ups are you doing? And you're like, I don't have time to do push-ups. I'm reading about push-up theory right. all the time, right? <laughs> like, you can get people that don't read a book ever and they just do push-ups a lot. And even if they're not doing it as well as a person that reads about it, they're going to be in much better shape. And I'm glad you're, you're calling this out because knowledge is power is something you hear everybody say all the time. And, they, and it's said in the way of, well, if people knew better, they would do better. No, not all the time. I think most people know sugar and carbs are bad. Okay. And it's really hard to not eat sugar and carbs. It's like this, it, people know exercise and fitness is important, but we don't all do it. People know when it comes to investing, you're going to have to get out there and, and make some mistakes and learn, but we don't want to do it. And that kind of opens the door for lie number three. Now, we briefly discussed this earlier, and that is that genius is born, as opposed to like you were saying when we first started the conversation. It's something that can be learned, and there's an actual system to what uh, people are doing. And I will admit that some people are born with a proclivity to picking it up faster, but there's still something that they're doing that can be copied. Do you have any examples of uh, people that maybe you've coached or people that you've seen in the space that have thought that they couldn't do something, realized there was a methodology to success and have turned it around? Yeah. I mean, I had a recent example. We have a learning center here in uh, Westchester, New York. And one of of our clients was really nervous because they are very introverted and not just introverted, but they're almost painfully shy. And uh, they are in the space and they in, in real estate and they want, they know that if they had a better memory that they could be more effective, right? People would, would have more confidence in them. They would feel more heard, right? Cause how are you going to share, how are you going to be able to show you care if you don't care enough just to remember the things that they are important to them, right? And, and one of the things was he was going to this networking function, a conference with like a mastermind and he was really nervous because he also is, he says that he's really bad at remembering people's names. Right. And it was, it was interesting because we went through some training, gave him a couple of tips. And, you know, one of the things is like, and I'm sure everybody here would like to be better at remembering names, right? Cause I think it's number one business etiquette, networking skill, but even something simple, like let, let's say somebody listening right now, I'm talking to you. You have trouble remembering people's names, but let's say, uh, David and Rob have a suitcase, let's say of a million dollars cash for you tax free. If you just remember the name of the next stranger you meet, who's going to remember that person's name to take home that million? Everybody, right? So as a coach, I have to call people on their BS, their uh, their belief systems, 
right? It had <laughs> nothing to do with your capability or your potential. It had everything to do with whether you're motivated or not. And I think something simple, um, so we went through this, these exercises, some visualization exercises, um, simple things like uh, turn the person's name into a picture right after you have like a reason to remember their name. Uh, you know, David, for me, I use a slingshot. Right. And so like, imagine meeting David here and, and you take a, a slingshot and a slingshot, by the way, for David and, and Goliath. Right. So I, yeah, that, that helps okay, me okay. kind got of it, it. sink it in. And then I would just like, you know, pop right there on, on his great shirt. And I would remember that. And if you're watching this on video, then you'll, you'll see the shirt that he's wearing or, or some of his facial hair. And, you know, later on you say goodbye to that person and you just remember, Hey, this person has that shirt or that, that facial hair. And then what did I do? I said, slingshot, what's his name? David, right? You know, for Rob, I could, uh, you know, I could rob Rob, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I could imagine doing that. That's a good one, Jim. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things, what, if it makes you laugh, that's why we remember. So many times we forget something because we just hear it, right? But if you could see it and then it makes it, you have, you feel something because of it, you're more likely to remember it. But coming back to, to this, even when we're, when we're thinking about the mistakes that we make or genius is born, I really think genius is built. If someone is extraordinary, certainly they could have certain talents and certain charisma. Um, but usually it's forged through deep work, through sacrifice, right? All the stuff you don't see on Instagram, all the, all those workouts, those late nights where you have to feed your business until your business feeds you back. Right. And so, um, you know, I think we make these choices. There's a quote in my book, Limitless Expanded, where it says, life is the letter C between B and D. Life is C between B and D. And B stands for birth. D stands for death. Life C in the middle, choice. You know, our lives are the sum total of all the choices we made up to this point. And I truly believe that these difficult times, they could distract you. These difficult times, they could diminish you. Or these difficult times, they could develop you we ultimately decide. And every day we have a chance because every day we can make a new choice. So help me understand here with the idea of knowledge is power. The idea is, you know, you don't actually know it until you actually go out and apply it. Yeah. But then to reach that next level of genius, it's not only applying it, but it's applying it with consistency and tenacity to the point where you actually are really like a genius at that thing. Is that, is that sort of the difference between the two? Yeah, I think consistency compounds, but I also think if we're persistent, we could achieve it, right? But if we're consistent, we get to keep it. And so many people could be persistent and go to the gym and get that body, but That's good. they're not going to keep it unless like there's a difference yeah. between something being attainable and sustainable, right? In business, in our body, and same with our, our brain. So I, I think consistency trumps everything and consistency compounds, right? You started at this point, you had your $40,000 and little by little, a little became a lot. So many people could just give up and make, you know, let that mistake make them and then they fall, right? And again, I, I don't know a strong person that had an easy past. And I think these mistakes, when you get up, you build that strength every single time. And it's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's pretty straightforward. Right. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more because I like, I was telling <laughs> David always makes fun of me for it, but like, I'm still relatively involved in my business more than I should be. I'm a big believer that you should always be a student of your craft. And like, I get all of the messages from Airbnb to my phone. I have a property manager that actually manages those, but I like to get them because I like to sort of still be in the weeds. Uh, but like the other day on a podcast, I got like a, a phone call and I was like, and I got it and I checked the voicemail and Dave was like, what are you doing? I was like, it could be an Airbnb guest. He's like, you don't need to do that. I'm like, I know, but I don't, I think it's very easy to pull yourself out of the business so much to where you get a little rusty and uh, to stay sharp. I think that consistency is how you stay sharp in really any vertical that you do, but specifically real estate. I feel like I've, I'm always making my life a little harder than it should be, mostly because I just like to know do I still got it or have I kept it? Yeah. And we have, we make decisions all the time. And the, the question is, are we remember with those mistakes and the power of feedback is are is the feedback, are we getting closer to our goals or are we stalling or actually going the opposite direction? Earlier, you mentioned the, the three components of a limitless mindset. I'm going to ask you in a second, we're going to recap those, but before we do, I wanted to get your take on an issue I'm having in my life. Within the different companies I have and in the industry I operate in, I've got real estate sales teams, mortgage companies, I own investment properties. 
I have noticed a trend of human beings that are good communicators. They're very articulate. Reading something somebody smart figured out, regurgitating the information to the masses, they appear very intelligent because they're talking about something that other people, it just goes over their head. They don't understand. They get credit for being smart. But when when the ship that they're captaining actually ends up in choppy seas, they have no idea what to do. And it's become a bit of a pet peeve that it's very easy to portray yourself as knowledgeable because you've taken in all the information and you know how to repeat what someone else said. And it's it's different than when you have what I call experiential knowledge. I, I, for, I refer to it as like kinetic knowledge if it's like a martial art or something. But it, it I don't know, Jim. It's very different in my mind. The person that actually understands the concept and the fundamentals and knows how to navigate through them versus I heard someone else say this and I'm repeating it and I sound smart. Do you have any advice on how to pay attention to where you're getting information from, or maybe some of the people listening to this have tricked themselves into thinking yeah. that they have more knowledge than they really do because they've heard other people say that smart things. Yeah. I mean, I subscribe to, you could trust, but you could also verify. And it's one of those things where I believe the life we live are the lessons that we teach. And when somebody's congruent in terms of not only their mindset, but they're consistently motivated. Um, they're using real methods that produce real results that you can't fake it. It's tough in social media world where everyone's comparing themselves to everybody else. And, you know, the grass is greener, frankly, where you water it. And it's greener sometimes in social media land. You know, you follow these real estate influencers, whatever, right? Because sometimes it's greener because of, you know, there's a lot of artificial turf out there. <laughs> You know, there are a lot of people like that really yeah. understand optics. And yeah. I mean, I always look for competence and character for me, for me. It's, it's a level of, you know, the people I do business with and, you know, we have different visions of our company and you know, we have a global organization, students and clients in every country in the world. So we have a lot of data, but I want people who are world-class at what they do. Cause I feel like we are world-class at what we do, but then also somebody could be competent, not have character. And I don't really mm -hmm. want to do business with that person or somebody could have a lot of character and not be competent and capable. And that doesn't really help I, either <laughs> as well. But yeah, I absolutely. I love your analogy of artificial turf. That's going down on the Mount Rush. Yeah, that's good. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or that's it's greener one. on the other side. If it's greener on the other side, not only because there's artificial turf, maybe it's the filter they're using, yeah. you know, and they right. could look, you know, greener. So to that effect, Rob, you are doing it the right way by keeping your finger on the pulse. I'm actually, uh, I'm, ch I'm changing my tune a little bit. I do think that it's wiser that you know what's going on. I just get irritated when you're the guy that has to take the call to put the spa on the deck when we're in the middle of recording the podcast. But other than that, <laughs> I think you do a very good job of actually watering that grass. That one was, they were craning it on and I couldn't, I couldn't not answer. It was it's expensive. It's like $400 a day for a crane and it worked out. It's a great spa. Jim, you're a master of frameworks. And earlier you mentioned the three components of a limitless mindset, yeah. our mindset, motivation, and methods with the benefit of, or the bonus of momentum. How do yeah. these components sort of work together in a synergistic way to create the superpower? Yeah, this is everything. And if people understand this framework, I think that they're, they have a lens to look at the world. So let's say you have a goal, right? And you want to get there as fast as you can. There are three components. Going back to that where you feel like you're stuck in that box, the three dimensional, the three forces that contain that box are the same three forces that will liberate you out of that box and give you the freedom that you desire and that you deserve. And those three dimensions are the three, the three M's the mindset, motivation and methods. And so what I mean by that is let's say you have a limitless mindset, your mindset or your set of assumptions and attitudes you have about something, right? And it could be about money or real estate or how difficult something is, right? Often the problem is not the problem. Often the problem is our perception or our assumptions or attitudes about the problem itself, right? That's usually the problem. And so with mindset, you have to unravel it because if people don't believe it's possible or they're capable or they deserve it, they're still gonna be stuck in that box, right? And so that's why we go through all the lies that could be holding them back. Uh, we go through their self-talk. Some people, like in my case for memory, people say, I don't have a great memory. They could just adjust it and say, like, I don't have great memory yet. Right. Something like a little like that opens up the possibility. Now somebody could have like they work on their mindset and they believe it's possible. They have that growth mindset. It's not fixed and still be stuck because they're not motivated. They don't have the second key. They're not motivated to get out of that box. 
right? They're not motivated to get out of that financial situation or, or, you know, whatever, or their health situation or their relationship situation. And for me, just for everyone listening, motivation, I believe is not something you have. It's something you do. And to attest to that, there are three things that will give you greater motivation. And this is the formula. Motivation, limitless motivation, whether you want to motivate yourself or motivate someone to buy something or motivate your kids to clean their room or floss their teeth, you need P times E times S3. So we'll, we'll deconstruct this. P is purpose, right? People will not buy or, or sell or go to the gym if they don't feel the reason, right? Because we are not logical, right? People don't buy logically. They buy what? They buy emotionally, right? And they justify logically because we are not logical. We are biological. You think about like the dopamine, the oxytocin, the serotonin, endorphins, we are this chemical feeling soup. You're talking about what controls our decision-making. Very much so. It's how you feel. Because when you're in a certain state, you're going to make different decisions. If you're coming from a state of fear uh, or scarcity, you're not going to see that opportunity and you're not going to act on it, right? So we have to, all learning like life is state dependent. So motivation is purpose and you need to feel that purpose because everyone knows intellectually why they should you know, follow your advice, right? But if they're not, check in with the first letter, the P, do they have a reason? And do they feel that reason? Not intellectually know it, but feel it in, you know, in their, in their body. But somebody could have limitless purpose and still not act because they need the E, P times E times S3. The E is energy. You know, I, I realize that if people are struggling with mental fatigue, brain fog, lack of sleep, right? Like, uh, I mentioned I have a, a 10 month old and, you know, we, are not sleeping very well in this house. Uh, that, that, I don't feel very motivated to work out because I'm exhausted, right? And so, you know, optimize. If, if somebody eats a big processed meal, they're not going to feel like they want to be able to read, study, present, go on those sales calls, whatever, right? Those showings because they're tired. So energy has to be optimized. And that's why in the book, we talk about 10 keys for literally limitless energy. And then finally, somebody could have limitless purpose and energy and still not be motivated to procrastinate because they need S3 and three S's, small, simple steps. And what I mean by that is, let's just say, like exercise is great for your brain. You create brain-derived neurotropic factors, BDNF, which is like fertilizer for your brain. Um, it helps lower systemic inflammation, helps uh, you know with glucose sensitivity, all these great benefits, right? But if you're not exercising on a regular, then you know maybe it's too big. Like some people set goals and then those are too big and a confused mind won't do anything. Confused mind won't buy, right? You know, they won't sell a confused mind. It will be disenabled. Right. And so how do you overcome that kind of like that, that's that static where you don't have momentum is a small, simple step. And so maybe it's not going to the gym. That's too big for somebody who doesn't exercise. Maybe a small, simple step, put on your sneakers, right? Uh, maybe somebody, you know, you read to succeed. People have seen photos of me with Elon or Oprah, or whoever, you know, people ask how we bonded. We connected over books because you read to succeed. You can learn from other people's mistakes because there's two ways of learning something, right? Either through your own personal experience or from other people's experience. And I'd rather, you know, we hear about other people's money, right? OPM. But what about other people's like experiences, Right. And so if someone has decades of experience like you guys do, and if you happen to put it into a book and someone could read that book in a few days, then they can download decades in a day. So they still need to do the work, but at least they have some ideas, some insights, some instructions, some models and so on. So a small, simple step is so important. Like I just did, I have, we have a podcast and all on brain performance and we had a uh, one of the top biological dentists there. And we're talking about oral hygiene is good for your, you know, brain health and talking about flossing, right? And if, if you can't get your kids to floss their teeth, small, simple step, get them to floss one tooth. Cause nobody's going to stop there, right? I was talking about leaders or readers. If you want to read 30 minutes a day and become an expert in your, in your space and study everything that the latest and greatest in your industry and you're not doing it, maybe a small, simple step, open the book right? Read one line. And so how you find your small, simple step and people can write this down. This is a question I ask myself 10, 20 times a day. Whenever I feel stalled or confused, that's a dilemma. I have to make a decision. I always ask myself this question verbatim. What is the tiniest action I could take right now that will be, give me progress towards this goal where I can't fail? What is the tiniest action I could take now, right? Operative now, you know, that will give me progress towards this goal right? Not away from this goal 
where I can't fail. And that's where you're going to get your, your S3, your small, simple steps. And then that person's going to be motivated. If they have purpose, they have energy and they have a small, simple step to take little by little, little becomes a lot because inch by inch is a cinch yard by yard. It's just, it's just way too hard. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I mean, this is a, uh, something that, that very similar to what you and Brandon said for so many years, the, the men's, the minimum important next step, I think. Is that, is that what it stood for? And it most important next step, most important next step, um, where, you know, you break it down into a hundred steps and, you know, when you kind of do it that way, it's really anything is kind of easy. Yeah. And if you want to motivate someone else to buy, maybe they have purpose, they feel right. And maybe they have energy or resources. Money could be a form of energy. And, but maybe they're not buying because you're not making it simple enough for them to do. Give them small little steps so they have consistency and commitment. Yeah, this is something I break down really quite a bit for so many people. And they're like, how do I get started? I don't know where to get started. And I'm like, all right, well, what do you want to do? I want to buy a house. Okay, um, go to Zillow.com. Type in a city that you're interested in. Call a realtor. Get pre-approved with a lender. Yeah. Make an offer get declined, make another off, you know? And so it's like when you really do break it down into even more minute steps than that, it's kind of like, oh, okay. I guess that buying a house is really just like a series of very tiny steps to, to what seems like a, a giant significant goal, but it, everything is relatively easy when you break it down in small snackable sizes. Yeah. And one step in another direction, remember it, could, can, it completely changes your destination. Right. And so getting people to act on those small, simple steps, especially us, right? To overcome that fear. And maybe it's not a, a big mistake. Maybe it's a small little step that we can't fail at, you know? And then, so that's the second part, the M. So you have mindset and motivation and somebody, but someone still could be stuck in that box because they have the right, they, maybe they have the limitless mindset. They deserve it. It's possible for them and they're motivated to get out of that box, but they could still be stuck in that box because they need the third M, which are the right methods. Because some people are just using antiquated methods right? Of marketing or, or, or sales or negotiation or, you know, legal, like you have to upgrade your knowledge, skills, and abilities constantly to be able to, to be able to create that kind of result. And so I think a lot of times, especially in today's economy and um, environment, right? Where everything going on in the world, sometimes we downgrade our dreams and our goals to meet the current situation. And I think it's a big mistake, you know, what we're doing with, with clients is say, Hey, don't downgrade your dreams to meet the current situation. Instead, upgrade your mindset, your motivation and the methods you're using to be able to meet those bold, audacious goals. That's fantastic. Love it. Jim, if you already went over before we did this, but if I hadn't have been one over, you would have won me over now. <laughs> I just wish we were recording all of this. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the Cinderella story. For intelligence where you you just got your butt kicked early on in life and then in order to climb out of that hole you figured out how to put things into frameworks or models and now you're this gem of a human being that gets to share this information with everybody else who thankfully doesn't have to go through all the pain that you did to get to this point so thank you for your contribution to humanity as well as thank you. your contribution to our podcast if people want to know more about you and find the book where can they go um, I have a gift for everybody. This is something that we've used with our one-on-one -on -one clients for years, and it doesn't cost anything. There's nothing to buy. But there's a big chapter in the book that I want to give people, and it's all about brain types. And I realized, like, you know how there's personalized medicine based on your genetics, and there's personalized nutrition based on your microbiome? We've created a way to personalize learning based on your brain type. And I found out that there are about four specific brain types and I use animals as the metaphor. And once you know your brain animal, you know, cause we'll give you instruction on how to read faster, how to remember names, how to remember facts, client information, product information, all of that based on your brain animal. And uh, people could take that quiz in four minutes. It's so simple. You can have your team do it also. It is have your family do it. It will open your mind. And it's at mybrainanimal.com, mybrainanimal.com. Uh, the book you can find anywhere, Limitless Book, is probably the best place because we donate 100% of the proceeds to charity uh, to build schools for children in need. Uh, we built schools with the previous book in Ghana, Guatemala, Kenya, also Alzheimer's research uh, in mem memory of my grandmother. So if you go to limitlessbook.com, you can get your copy there. And we're going to gift you 13 days uh, lessons on how to read faster, improve your memory. It's a quick start program that we sell for hundreds of dollars, way more than the investment of this book. And you can get a limitlessbook.com. And I would challenge everyone to take a screenshot wherever you're consuming this right now and, and tag us all. 
on social media. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is share your brain animal from the quiz or share one thing you're going to do for a better brain. Maybe you're going to prioritize your sleep. Maybe you're going to just eat a little bit better today. Maybe you're going to do some exercise today. Maybe you're going to read something today, right? Study. But one thing, and because you tag us all in it, we'll get to see it, obviously. And I'll repost some of my favorites and I'll actually gift uh, three or four copies of the book out to your community just as a thank you for having me on your show. So cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. That's amazing. Uh, That's awesome. And the book comes out today. As we're listening to this podcast, the book is out now. So there you go, folks. You're part of an exclusive community of people that heard about this the day that it comes out. So go pick up your copy at Limitless Book. And do you have any social media or anywhere where people can follow you, Jim? Yeah, not hard to find. Jim Quick. You just have to spell it right. K-W-I-K on all social media. It's real, my real last name. I didn't change it to do... Uh, this this line of work is my father's name, my grandfather's name, and Jim so quick they call him Nestle on the streets. Oh, like Nestle, <laughs> love it. Yeah, Nestle quick. All right, Rob, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can find me over uh, on YouTube and uh, Instagram on uh, Rob Built R O B U I L T, and I teach you real estate and, and short term rentals and the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness and all that stuff. But what about you? <laughs> You can find me at davidgreen24.com where you won't find any of those things, but you will figure out ways that can help people build their wealth <laughs> as well as David Green 24. Jim, thanks again for being on, man. Best of luck to you with the book. Thanks for writing it and keep them coming. All right. That was our interview with brain coach Jim Quick. Rob, do you feel smarter yet? Uh, absolutely. I would leveled up listening to that guy, man. He's so smart and uh, brought up a lot of really amazing concepts that honestly, I feel really parallel a lot of the things you outline in Pillars of Wealth. What do you think? Yeah, that is a great point there. I talk a lot about in Pillars, especially in the second pillar, which is the art of making more money, being better at your job and bringing more value. It's all about personal development. That's what leads to your ability to make more money. It is growing yourself. And Jim talked about that exact same concept. How do you get smarter? How do you remember things better? How do you increase your confidence? How do you build momentum? Those are literally chapters in the book, how to build momentum. Um, confidence has to do with building skills. And I talk about that as well as taking on more responsibility. So as he was, as he was talking, I was thinking, oh, this is all the stuff that's in the book. So make sure you get a copy of Limitless, Jim's new book, and then get a copy of Pillars of Wealth and pair them together like Cabernet and red meat. Now I'm hungry for, for steak and wine, but I'm going to read this book and I'm going to, I think the thing I t- took away from this is consistency is how you keep the skills that you've done. I'm going to go look at my business and see where I've been inconsistent because most of the time when there's a problem in my business, it's because I've been horribly inconsistent with my processes and systems. So that's what I took away from today. And if you like today's show and you want to hear more from Mr. Jim Quick, check out Bigger Pockets Podcast episode number 443 to hear our first interview with him. And Jim will be on the Rookie Podcast episode 344 as well. Thanks again. We love you guys. We appreciate your patronage. If you've got a minute, check out another Bigger Pockets video. And if you don't, we will see you next week. This is David Green for Rob Doesn't Quite Understand Urban References Abasolo, signing off. <laughs>